So, Kate, Roger Rogerson, of course, died at 83 years old on Sunday. And you've covered all sorts of corruption, all sorts of notorious criminals for more than 30 years. So through that lens, I'd love to ask you, why is Roger Rogerson so renowned? I mean, what makes him stand out amid what have really been tons of corrupt cops over the years who've walked our streets? Look, none have ever been as corrupt as Roger Rogerson. And I think the astonishing thing about him was that at one stage, this was New South Wales' most decorated police officer. So you've got the the two sides of here's the public side, this brave, courageous police officer, and then you've got the reality of him killing people while he was a police officer, engaging in organised crime, orchestrating organised crime, and basically letting some of the nation's most scary and dangerous criminals actually get away with their crimes. I mean, it's it's hard to even imagine that that is possible. It, it does beggar belief. So can you give us some specifics? Take us through, I guess, some of the most notorious crimes that he committed. Well... There, Roger Rogerson joined the police force in, in 1958. So we fast forward and, you know, by the 1980s, he's working in a notorious squad called the Armed Hold-Up Squad. So somewhere along the line, he gets into bed with basically the chief <laughs> armed robber in the state who'd also been to jail for rape and was a heroin dealer, Arthur Arthur Nettie Smith. So it's basically they join forces and Roger says, Nettie, okay, that they actually work out where to where to rob banks. We won't be there. We'll be turning a blind eye. And in return, I need a cut of things. I also need information on other criminals so I can look like I'm doing great stuff. So at the same time, he was eliminating Nettie's rivals. And I think, you know, when the pair fell out, you know, Nettie Smith basically said, Roger gave me the green light to do any kind of crime I wanted except for murder, which he did anyway. (laughs) He ended up doing a life sentence uh, for a murder. But the thing is, when you look at, you know, here is one of the state's most decorated officers in league with one of the state's most serious criminals. Now, where it actually went wrong for Roger was in 1981, Nettie Smith organised for Roger Rogerson to meet a um, an up-and-coming criminal, Warren Lanfranchi. And Warren had shot at a police officer, had also um, been involved in a heroin rip-off, and he knew he was in trouble. So Nettie Smith had organised for him to meet Rogerson in a laneway in Dangar Place in Chippendale in Sydney's um, inner, um, inner west. And with him, you know, he took $10,000 to, to basically pay his way out of trouble. So waiting for him in Dangar Place was Roger Rogerson and a number of his colleagues. So what happened was that... Um, Roger shot and killed Warren Lanfranchi. And it was interesting that in, at the inquest later, um, evidence was given from people who were nearby that they heard one shot followed by a six-second delay and another shot, which was basically um, Roger shooting him, then walking over to the body and making sure that he was dead. Now, When the inquest came around, it was revealed that um, Lanfranchi's girlfriend at the time, Sally Ann Huckstep, said, you know, look, he had $10,000. He also did not have a weapon. He was not going to confront, you know, somebody of the likes of Roger Rogerson. And Roger tried to say he pulled a gun and that's why I shot him in rapid fire. But as I said, six second delay. Warren Lanfranchi walked directly towards me. And then when we got to, he got to about here, he kept walking into the lane. 
And because of that point of time, he then suddenly just backed around and pulled this gun out from these very tight trousers. And as he was bringing it up, I realised this bloke's going to shoot me. So I reached behind for my gun, and because I didn't mess around, and I brought it up and I fired one shot. And then fairly quickly after that, I fired a second shot. And of course, it killed him. And it was interesting that the at the inquest that it they were not satisfied that Roger shot while trying to preserve his own safety. They did not come to that conclusion. They, it was in the line of duty, but they weren't convinced that Lanfranchi had fired. A gun was never found. The $10,000 was never found. But interestingly, two women who gave evidence about Rogerson and Nettie Smith both, both died. So one of them was the Sally Ann Huckstep. Now, she'd gone on 60 Minutes, mm. she'd gone on A Current Affair. She was saying there is something really corrupt yeah. in New South Wales police. People find it very hard to conceive that uh, upstanding, upright members of our police force are corrupt. They don't want to believe it. It doesn't make you feel very protected. And most people just can't conceive of it. If what you say is right, and you were frightened before, before Warren was killed, you have every reason to be terrified right now. I've been in hiding since Warren's death. Uh, I'm quite sure that um, the police <laughs> would probably kill me. So she was, you know, a danger to them, and her body was found um, in a pond in Centennial Park in early uh, 1986. But the other person, Lynn Woodward, who was giving similar evidence to Sally Ann Huckstep. She disappeared while giving evidence mm. and was never seen again. No one ever knows what happened to her, but it's widely believed that Rogerson organised to have her killed. But the, you know, while he got away with the, um, the Land Franchi shooting, it was such big publicity at the time that somebody could be shot dead mm. in, you know, basically inner city Sydney, that the spotlight was now on just the darker sides of Roger Rogerson. And then we, so this is 1981. So in 1984, Michael Drury, who is an undercover detective, is in his own home in Chatswood, he's 31 years old, he's got two little kids, he's feeding one of the kids in a high chair, mm. and he's shot twice in the chest. The detective, the senior constable, had been standing at the kitchen sink of his Chatswood home shortly after six o'clock this evening when two shots were fired through the window. He was rushed to the Royal North Shore Hospital in a critical condition with gunshot wounds to the chest and stomach. The police helicopter was called in to search for the culprit. A police tracker dog was used to sniff the trail of the gunman, while dozens of other police converged on the area. But the gunman remains at large, having driven off at high speed. The detective involved is understood to have taken part in a major drug operation recently involving Victorian and federal police. Now, he thinks he's going to die and gives a dying deposition to say... I, as an undercover cop, was mm. going to be one of the chief witnesses against a Melbourne major drug dealer, Alan Williams. Roger Rogerson, one of my police colleagues, offered me a bribe to somehow, you know, lose the evidence mm. or not give evidence against Alan Williams. And as it turned out, Rogerson was charged both with the bribe mm. and 
with the attempted murder of Michael Drury. And he was acquitted of both. And the most astonishing thing about this was that even the drug dealer, Alan Williams, gave evidence that, yes, um, we'd organised for a $50,000 payment to be made to notorious hitman Chris Flannery to do away with um, Michael Drury and Roger Rogerson was involved. But and, he got off. And this would have to be the worst crime a cop can commit, which is to kill another cop. Absolutely. And my understanding is there's actually a lot of people in New South Wales police, at least at the time, who also believed that Roger Rogerson had actually attempted, yeah, attempted to murder an undercover, undercover cop, cop. Exactly. who wouldn't take the bribe. Yes. So this is so you know, this is nineteen eighty four. Now, funnily enough, the person who supposedly pulled the trigger Chris Flannery, he disappears as well. Notorious hitman. Notorious hitman, known as rent kill And guess what? His body has never been found either. And uh, as Nettie Smith was later to tell police, Roger actually said to me, come on, mate, you know, Chris was becoming a problem to us all. He had to go. So, I mean, you think <laughs> and these were these were the things he was doing while he was still in the police force. <laughs> I mean, it beggars belief. And I'd love, it, you, I'd love it if you could take me back, if you can, a bit by telling me who was Roger Rogerson? I mean, before he joined the police force in 1958, I believe he had just turned 17. Do we know anything about his life yes, before look, then? He, um, he grew up... In, in Bankstown, in Sydney's southwestern suburbs, and then he went to Homebush High School. Um, his parents had um, emigrated from the UK. So, you know, I think, as you said, Rogerson joined the police, you know, at, in 1958 at the age of 17. So, you know, he graduated from Homebush High School. There was nothing really, um, you know, fairly quiet life. He married a, a woman called Joy and they had two daughters. He later, um, I don't know whether they ever married, but his partner was um, Annie Malocco. And it was in, you know, we fast forward now to um, 1986. So he's or he's been in the force for almost 30 years and they finally drum him out on you know, numerous misconduct charges. You know, he's already been acquitted of bribery, he's suspected of murder, but all they could come up with to get him out of the force was, you know, um, I think there was six of nine misconduct charges were found against him. But it was after he left the police force that he actually went to jail. And we were mentioning earlier about him... Um, being acquitted of the bribery charge against Michael Drury. Now, obviously, this took Rogerson by surprise because I like, knew he'd done it. And I think he was expecting that he was going to go to jail for this. So he was overheard talking to his wife and others about the secret bank accounts he'd set up in false names in preparation for him going to jail. So he actually went to jail for that. And then we fast forward to 2006 when he's again back in jail. And this time he's caught lying to the um, Police Integrity Commission over you know dealings with um, a contractor at Liverpool, Liverpool Council whose name was Mr Ten. His nickname, according to Roger, was Mr Ten Percent because you had to pay him 10% of your contract in order to get the contract. Kate, I really want to turn to, I guess, why it took so long for Roger Rogerson to actually be convicted of any crime, sent to jail when there was allegations against him so much testimony against him for so long that he had actually been guilty of heinous crimes, including murder. Why did it take so long for him to be held to account? Look, I think when you are as powerful as he is, um, you know, someone was telling me the other day that um, their father got a call from um, Roger Rogerson and the father had been a witness to a robbery. And imagine getting a call from Roger Rogerson saying, you go to the police, you open your mouth, and you know what will happen. 
So did the man talk? No, he didn't. So I think the thing is that the the, the legend of Roger Rogerson and the danger he posed did actually make people think twice about crossing him. But it was interesting that um, I think modern technology finally caught up with him because in um, 2014, I mean, this is just the most extraordinary thing. Rogerson is 73. He's got a dodgy hip. You know, he walks with a cane. And yet he gets arrested for the murder of a 20-year-old aspiring drug dealer, Jamie Gow. And Jamie's murdered um, in a a warehouse um, in, uh, in Sydney. Rogerson was wanted for questioning over Jamie Gow's murder. The 20-year-old university student vanished last Tuesday after an alleged drug rip-off. His body found floating off Cronulla yesterday. Jamie Gow's uh, body was weighted down and dumped off the coast of Cronulla. And they did a really bad job and up it bobbed. So police then followed Jamie Gow's movements. They... um, you know, within, you know, minutes, they'd got footage of Jamie Gow going to the warehouse. There's Roger. You can see Glenn Myra going to the shops to buy, buy a, you know, blue tarpaulin. They're nabbed in an instant. And you wonder how much um, modern technology played a role in this. Because, you know, in the past, a lot of bodies were meant to be dumped out at sea and they were never found. So, you know, I think Roger was sort of losing his grip, you know, a bit. There is now a national manhunt for Roger Rogerson. He's picked up on phone taps saying, oh, you've seen the news about me. It's effing dreadful. They're looking (laughs) for me everywhere. But now, about this extortion, I reckon we can still do it. And you think... You wanted for murder and you're still trying to finalise your extortion plot. Roger Caleb Rogerson, under arrest. Mr Rogerson, do you maintain your innocence? Do you maintain your innocence, sir? We're back to the Gestapo days now. The ultimate fall from grace, manhandled in handcuffs from his Padstow home by detectives. Did you kill Jamie Gow? Solicitor, I'm saying nothing. Are you you concerned about the possibility of spending life in prison? But I wanted to go back a bit and, you know, you've mentioned that Roger Rogerson was a terrifying individual Mm. and therefore he successfully you know, intimidated people so they wouldn't sort of give testimony against him. But of course, there were all these examples where, you know, Sally Ann Huckstep and other people actually did give testimony or did speak out against him. They might have disappeared. So I wanted to know what how that reflects on the police force. I mean, how what does that suggest about the police force that, you know, he was palling around with hitmen, seeming unsupervised. No one above him seemed seemed to have sort of they weren't worried. Well, I mean, it was often joked that um, Rogerson was the best that money could buy. (sighs) And I think it was one of those things that, you know, New South Wales police were absolutely notoriously corrupt. And the Victorian police loathed to have anything to do with the New South Wales police because their witnesses would be murdered or would disappear. And it was interesting that it, it wasn't until the um, the Wood Royal Commission in the 1990s, and the Wood Royal Commission was into police corruption, that this was exposed in all its ugly, ugly ugliness. And I'm just wondering, I mean, is there an argument to be made that Roger Rogerson was actually a product of his environment, you know, that he didn't enter the police force at 17 aiming to be as corrupt as possible and just go about murdering people for his own financial gain, but actually that he was mentored by this culture that was so corrupt and that he he joined it? Look, I think yes and no. I think it was a corrupt culture. And I think especially in the police at that time, it was basically might is right. We know that X is a heroin dealer. We know he's done a lot of bad things. So 
We're just going to plant a gun on him. We're going to plant some drugs on him. We are going to make up his statement. And this is what was called verbaling, which was, um, you know, oh, yep, the, the, the person said, yeah, fair cop, Gov. Yep, I did it. Yep, yep, I did all this. Funnily enough, they usually didn't sign these statements. But this was a culture of um, anything goes. It was like we have to do bad things in order to catch bad people, but it completely got out of control. So initially, the motive behind it, do you think there was some it was called, good to it? It was called what they called noble cause corruption. Okay, so we're corrupt, but there's a noble cause behind it. Right. Okay. And so... I wanted to ask you about your personal perspective on Roger Rogerson, because you actually had a run-in with him. He, I believe, attempted to sue you for defamation. So can you please tell me about that and what sort of insights you personally gained into his personality? Well, yes, he was, from all accounts, um, could be quite charming. I, of course, never saw that side of him. And he did threaten to sue me for defamation, not for all the things that I'd written about him suggesting that he was a murderer. He took offence that I had said in an article, an article that he was pals with another um, crook cop whose name was Craig McDonald. But Craig's nickname was Snidely Whiplash after the baddie in a Dudley Do-Right cartoons. And I think of all the things that he took offence at. But anyway, he didn't go ahead with that. But after another article that I wrote, um, he did get a message to me that he and his associate at the time wanted me to know that if I was a man, they would have broken my jaw by now. So thanks, Roger. So Very not, kind of you. Definitely not the charming side uh, <laughs> to you. And so another thing I wanted to ask you about was there are numerous unexplained disappearances that are linked to Roger Rogerson. You know, he was either listed as a person of interest or even a suspect. So with his death, does this mean that these are likely to never be explained? I think that they are likely never to be explained. And, you know, I understand that um, b before he suffered the brain aneurysm, Roger was frail and ill and was in the hospital wing at uh, Long Bay Jail and that police... Um, had tried to appeal to his better side saying, you know, could you tell us, you know, what really happened in these cases? It would be, you know, really helpful to the families to know what went on and um, no joy there. Wow. And I wanted to ask you, I guess, a broad question about the culture of the police force. You mentioned what the culture was in the 70s and 80s and perhaps even a bit beyond. But what about now, the culture of the police force now? Could we ever, do you think, get a cop as corrupt as Roger Rogerson? Yes. I think that you could only because history throws up these you know, narcissistic psychopaths every now and then, I just think it would be harder to get away with the level of corruption. I mean, we're talking about multiple murders here. We're talking about letting people commit robberies, um, deal heroin, all those kind of things. Um, I just think that modern day technology makes it harder to get away with those things. Thank you, Kate, so much for taking us through this. My pleasure, Samantha.